Ah, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's a beautiful morning here. Beautiful morning to talk about Walden and Thoreau. And um, for folks that, that didn't uh, maybe make the connection before, I have a certain kind of connection to Thoreau myself, which is having read him in my early teens, I was inspired to ultimately build this little building I'm in. And let me give you a clip of this. So yeah, there's me waving. That's where I am. This is a, a clip. Um, I can set my phone up on a little tripod to take, a, to take that shot, which is what I did here. But I didn't do it this morning because it is really cold. Uh, not really cold, but pretty cold. And I have the, the windows closed here, so I didn't want to um, uh, go to all the trouble of opening the windows and being here shivering just to show you that. But yeah, Thoreau did inspire me. And it's, it's interesting, Thoreau has inspired all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. And it's sort of a testament to what ultimately I would say is great literature in so far as it has different things for different people. And for, as I noted in that introduction to Thoreau, for a generation, um, like starting in the 1960s, Thoreau was a real hero um, because of his sort of back to nature stance. You know, the idea of going back to wilderness and living there um, really appealed to some people. Um, if you've read the uh, or seen the film uh, um, Into the Wild, uh, which um, is about true wilderness, ultimately at the end in Alaska, and it's very different than the welcoming wilderness Thoreau has. Anyhow, Thoreau, it can be very problematic, which is why I went to the trouble of writing that introduction. First, because I, I wanted to put a, an addition up to Walden, uh, addition online that you could read in, in a pretty nice form. But also, we really need to, to approach Thoreau and Walden in a certain kind of way. And if we don't, one, we could just get preoccupied on the whole back to nature thing. And you could see how in an environmental class like this, you could certainly focus on that. And, and I, many, many, many classes have done that. But it's not what I wanted to do here. And also you could see, and, and many people commented on the fact, yeah, that Thoreau can be off-putting. He is a problem. He is ableist and, you know, um, he, his project is something that only... Yeah, I, I don't know that only a wealthy, white, you know, straight man could have done, but at the time, that's kind of, you know, what it worked best for. Now, that's not to say that people weren't doing things like this out of necessity. In fact, we don't, I didn't talk much in the intro about it, but um, you may recall that when Thoreau was building his house, uh, he takes part, part of it is built for material that he got from a little cabin that was owned by an Irish family, um, um, a father and a mother and a child, and Thoreau buys that so that he can build his own cabin uh, using some of those material, which is fine. But it's interesting, you know, what Thoreau doesn't make anything of at the time, you know, in the text, is that he's, you know, making this big deal about all this minimalist stuff that he's doing and all, and yet here's an actual family living that way already, living in a small little building like that, doing just what he wanted to do, but they were not doing it. In, in this effort of, you know, voluntary minimalism or voluntary simplicity. This was a reality of life. Thoreau again notes just in passing that this was an Irish laborer. And at the time, this, you know, um, you know, 1850, around 1850, it's a little before 1850 when this actually was, when he was actually building the cabin. But at the time, that was the new group coming to the country. There were a ton of Irish, you know, immigrants coming in. There was an issue because uh, there's a lot of, um, dislike of that group as there is with each new group that have come to this country a lot of um yeah unfortunate you know behavior around that dislike and all so it's it's just intriguing that Thoreau doesn't even bother to mention that and I think that kind of speaks volumes about Thoreau that it just never occurred to him I mean it, it should occur to us right away it should just send up a big flag a lot of things should send up a big flag and as a consequence, you could you could just dismiss Thoreau, right? Um, and you know, especially reading him, there's so many moments where you could just dismiss him. 
But there's there's something in Thoreau, I think, that's still worthwhile and important for us to think about. There's something life-changing in Thoreau. When I noted in my introduction, you know, he's sort of, you know, stepping outside of the role scripted for him to to stop and analyze the role, and then ultimately to write his own. And I connected up, you know, two of to throws two major works, Walden and On Civil Disobedience, in the um, introduction because you can see what he's do as what he's doing here is sort of a civil disobedience in a way too. It's sort of you know opting out of consumer culture and then stepping outside of it as you know an act of passive resistance. It's an intriguing idea, and it is the way his mind worked. And, and of course, it was enormously influential. You know, I mean, we, we can't forget Thoreau in that sense and and ultimately I think his greatest legacy is is not that he was part of you know the inspiration for the back to nature movement of a couple generations ago um, or even the minimalist thing I mean while I think that's ultimately important you know he's not he's not new there there have been people um, throughout history that have been minimalist and in English 22 we look at um, you know works like Ben Johnson's to Penshurst which advocated for a smaller life and all granted Thoreau does it in a very practical sense but he is certainly not the only one to to have ever done that and or even to have taken it further than anyone else. You know, um, if you uh, read, you know, the life of the Buddha, I mean, he spent a lot of his time just living out in the forest, you know, uh, begging food. Um, so he wasn't doing any of the things that Thoreau did, and he just had, you know, one, one you know, a set of robes. So, sure, people can do it. Um, and, and as a consequence, Thoreau is, is, is important in this regard, and, and that's why we're reading him. But, but just to be clear, the civil disobedience that he, you know, argued for, again, was not new. You know, he looks to Socrates, people have looked to other people before him. But he was just enormously influential, as I noted in the introduction to Walden, um, on people like um, Gandhi and, and Tolstoy, and, and perhaps most um, relevant for us in, in the U.S. would be Martin Luther King Jr., of course. So uh, Thoreau is, is a really important and influential guy, although uh, certainly not without problems. But I was glad to, to read your comments, because many people were immediately, you know, looking at those problems and saw them. But on the other hand, um, took the time to see past them to what Thoreau was getting at. And I thought that was very, um, uh, well, I thought it was good. Okay, so let's jump right into the text here if we can. Scroll up. Oops, hold on here. I have some sort of problem going on. Let me see how I can resolve this. If I can just do that. Wow. How? How about that? One keystroke, I solved the whole thing. Um, he is spoiled, and he is at times racist. Um, he does call, I mean, in fairness, this was a term used at his time, the idea of like savages. But on the other hand, we now know that that's such a problematic term because it's sort of constructive and constructing, um, you know, Western U.S. identity at the cost of these other people and imagining them in a certain way. So it just shows, you know, how, how important something like a single term like that can be because it carries, it carries enormous weight and, and problems with it. Yeah. This person notes, I can, see, I can see how it still relates today. He mentions buying a house can take ages and it would be simpler to, build, um, to buy or build a smaller one that you can own. Um, one that wouldn't take most of your life to pay off so that you may enjoy the fruits of life. Yeah, so I mean, just pausing on that for a moment is something we just don't think about, right? The system that we have uh, now requires that, you know, we spend average, you know, 30 years of our lives paying off a house. If you think that you enter the, you know, job market sometime in your mid-20s and you retire sometime in your mid-60s, uh, well, you have, you know, 40 years that your, your, you know, your working period and 30 of those 40 um, you're using to pay off your house. And in fact, you can even get a 40-year mortgage, which I think is based on that idea. And, and throws, you know, stops to think about 
like that and says, that's crazy. And especially if you think about by the, you know, most of what you're paying when you're paying that money every month is you're paying interest on the house and all. And Thoreau's like wondering, like, what's that about? Yeah, um, even more relatable when he talked about college dorms, about how his um, house cost as much uh, as one. Um, so, except that he didn't need to pay annually and have to worry about loud and obnoxious roommates. <laughs> Um, so I think that person was just throwing that in. I believe these two things were what intrigued me most and caused me to go, ah, okay, I see what you mean, after paragraphs of barely understanding what was being said. This was a great comment for a number of reasons. First, uh, I think it was a very apt comment regarding, you know, the cost of um, a house and all. Um, a second, this person drawing attention to uh, Thoreau, relating this to college students and you know so Thoreau is in his late 20s when he's he's it is really I guess depending on when he's doing it and when he publishes and all he's in his 20s while he's doing this so he's uh, probably older than most people in the class but not by a whole lot and he, he clearly you know remembers dorm life and how it was simpler and and you know the fact that that was pretty expensive although there's no indication that Thoreau paid for his Harvard education or for the dorm there and all I mean he's 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 figuring out how much it cost and comparing that to the house there but it, it, there's no indication that Thoreau had a you know a job while he, he worked his way through school he was he was not he didn't need to do that he was wealthy to do it um but it's interesting because he does he does equate it to that and he is thinking back to that and i i, I have to think that in thoreau's I want to say kind of limited life experience, that's something that made an impression on him. In other words, maybe if he had been in other cultures and other places where people live in smaller dwellings and all, that might have made an impression on him and all, but he didn't have that. He had kind of limited experience, to be honest. And I think the, the one thing that he did remember was being back at, at college and, and what that was like, and he's imagining that again. And that probably maybe always stuck in his mind. I mean, I'm really just speculating here, but it might have stuck in his mind. It's like, well, that's all you kind of really need. You don't need a whole lot. Um, and yeah, so, um, and I, I don't think, by the way, he had to deal with um, with roommates or anything. I think it was probably much nicer than that. And the only reason I say this, uh, from my own personal experience, um, when I worked on my PhD at Harvard, the building that I lived in was um, an apartment building um, that was right next to the Harvard campus. It was right across the street. And these are very common because this was actually built as a dorm for, for Harvard students. And the apartment that I had would have been the typical room for a Harvard student. And I have to say, it was a pretty nice apartment. Um, and it had, you know, like mm, four separate rooms in it. It was, it was pretty large. The entire basement was taken up. Um, it had been changed since I lived there, but um, originally it was set up as a, as a kitchen to provide everyone's meals. And then the first floor was like a dining hall. And it, it was very nice. This is not a dorm that you're sharing with two, three, or four people. Um, this was an actual little apartment where you don't have to worry about anything because your meals are taken care of and all, and you could just walk across the street to the campus. So I think Thoreau's experience was, was pretty nice, you know. But with this person noted here, and aside from those particulars about Thoreau, that, you know, um, that after paragraph, this I'm quoting the person here, I'm just looking down, after paragraphs of barely understanding what was being said. Yeah, that's one of the problems with Thoreau, and I keep saying I'm, I'm going to make a translation of it someday. Um, the idea here is that it's just so difficult to read, and, and as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Thoreau is doing that intentionally. Thoreau is influenced with respect to his writing style by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who would in turn be enormously influential on Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche would actually carry um, a copy of Thoreau's essays around with him everywhere. Um, and if you're familiar with you know his sort of writing, which is this writing that requires a lot of interpretation on the part of the reader and how that would influence, as I noted in the introduction, people like Martin Heidegger and Jacques Derrida and, and many others in the 20th century. Um, it's a project that's designed to tr make you interpret it, to figure out what he's saying. And okay, I mean, it's an interesting project. We could 
spend a lot of time talking about that, but it doesn't make for an easy read and it doesn't make for a straightforward read when we're trying to talk about something straightforward here, like, you know, how much money you spend on your housing. So, okay. Um, many people noted this, that they've read Walden before um, in high school and someone actually mentioned they had to read it in junior high. Recall my uh, younger self having a deep fascination with the words of Thoreau to leave the prison of society and, and find solace in nature. However, that was an offshoot of my cynicism in which, in which I had a deep hatred for life around me, thinking people were shallow. I am older now and that bitterness is a relic of the past. I realize now that Thoreau was already born in a privileged position to live off grid. If that mission didn't work out, he would always have a comfortable home and society to go back to. Um, again, it's so great to have so many different perspectives in this class and I was grateful for this person to share um, their experience of you know, originally reading Thoreau. And, and being deeply cynical of life. Thoreau hits that note, he absolutely does. There's something, something kind of you know, catcher in the rye like about this thing. Um, that, you know, he, he appeals to people because it's just such a deep anger and frustration with the world in a certain kind of way. And I, I think that's yet another thing that's hard to, to get to get past in a way with Thoreau. I mean, you have to deal with that. And it's, it's, it's why it's such, it's such an interesting text that may, that may ultimately go by the wayside, I think, in, in, because it is problematic in different ways. But I, I thought this was a great comment regarding that. But there's more to this comment. So uh, he makes very um, especially important points about consumerism. He probably couldn't have imagined a world where everything is able to, everyone is able to, um, to show off their stories with a click of a button on a small phone. Yeah. So this is an, a great comment on consumerism. Um, Thoreau, of course, is objecting to it, but this person is, you know, bringing it into, you know, uh, I was going to say a 21st century perspective, but really the third decade of the 21st, where we have this curated view of life that pushes people to want the same objects as their favorite influence and because they want to be happy and content. Descriptive life, and this person I guess is referencing uh, my introduction to Walden. Descriptive life is basically written from them every time you crave to be another human on your favorite social media. I don't think there is going to be a time when consumerism is not rampant. We are programmed to keep desiring the rise of technology has amplified it. <sighs> um, yeah, this is, is such a great point. You know, if Thoreau was worried in his day about fashion, about the influencers in Paris setting the, the standard for what, you know, everyone is going to wear, if he was worried about that, what would he make of now? Where you have, you know, all these influencers online that have been conscripted by, you know, um, marketers to, to sell stuff. So you want to be like the person. And I, I mean, that's the model, right? You become an influencer, you go, um, and not, you know, you don't have to be a famous person to start, although, of course, famous people do become influencers. But if you figure out a way of becoming an influencer and you get hundreds of thousands or millions of subscribers, and then the big question is to how to monetize that and really what that question comes down to, you know, who can you sell your um, subscribers to? Who can, you know, and, and usually it, when it's something like cosmetics or fashion or whatever, it's people just as this person noted in the comment who want to emulate them and be like them. And it is a sobering thought to realize because it makes the project of subverting all this consumerism that much more difficult. And there's nobody really challenging it in a significant way, unfortunately. And, and that, that's what could potentially, I always think, be so cool. So we're going to see, um, kind of a spoiler, but the, the last film, probably the last film we're going to see, is a film called Happy. And in it, you have this guy who was um, some sort of financial person in London who had a very high paying job, kind of like a Wall Street person, um, except in England, and a very high paying job, and, and left that job to go work in Calcutta with people who had leprosy in a hospital, and left 
left all his money behind, everything behind to do that. And you might think, wow, that's, that's incredible or incredibly difficult and all. But the, the point of why that uh, guy was, was in the film was that, and, and he earnestly is, is suggesting, earnestly suggesting that he is much happier because of that. Um, that the life he lives is more rewarding on a day-to-day, that he feels better at the end of every day, and he didn't feel good at the end of any day back then. And that material possessions weren't giving him happiness, but, but being um, helpful in the world is, is just, you know, proven to, to have clicked for him and, and gave his life meaning and made him happy. Why I mention it, not to, to spoil the movie for you, but because, you know, I don't see any influencer doing that today. And wouldn't it be great if someone like, I don't know, Kanye West or someone who's, you know, has this, has been for years, decades, I guess, propounding how having, you know, this lifestyle that he has and all these possessions and money and all, is all held that as up like the ideal that everyone should want. And we're probably, you know, most people are never going to get anywhere near that ideal. But that's the ideal and that's the target and all. But wouldn't it be amazing if, if, if people like that started to do just what that, that guy did in the film and, and give it all up and go live a different kind of life. And it's what Thoreau did, although Thoreau didn't, you know, do it for the rest of his life. And, and another problem with Thoreau, what Thoreau did was pretty selfish while he was doing it. On the other hand, you know, as soon as he left, right as he left, as I noted in the introduction, you know, he gives that lecture, which was a lecture on civil disobedience, and, 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 you know, makes clear he's very concerned about slavery, and, and, and it, he was in a moment in history that he knew where, you know, change was in the air, and, and it would have been possible to end it, which it was, and, you know, we have to keep in context, right, you know, it's 10 years after, you know, um, Walden is, Walden was published in 1854, you know, in 1864, I mean, the Civil War was, 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 was brewing in a, in a certain kind of way. But in any event, uh, back to the online influencers, if, if, if there would be a change there, and I'm not saying you have to, to go to an extreme like Thoreau or like guy who you know gave his life up but if if there were like a new ideal um, was was able to form that would be um, you know incredibly important both with respect to environmental things and climate change but even cultural justice and all too um, hopefully something like that could happen I don't know but as this person writing the notes marketers are so powerful now and you know as much as we want to reel in things like you know unchecked free market capitalism i don't know that anyone's talking about stopping you know influencers from from selling stuff on their their youtube channels or tiktok channels so i don't know um but let's keep going yeah it's a great way to think of this. It is a thought experiment. So what Thoreau did was a real experiment, right? A gritty experiment. He actually went out there to live. Um, that, but you can do this kind of, you can do it right now. And, and I think in, Thoreau is encouraging us to do it when we read him, and that is to imagine another kind of life. He went out and did it, but maybe you'll do it, but just imagine it for the moment. Um, Unfortunately, you know, not many people buy into Thoreau's ideas using his own life experience. Thoreau tries to prove that most people can live a happier life by demanding less materialistic wealth and thus working less hours. According to Thoreau, people only need to work six weeks a year to sustain basic living. If we, uh, if we don't adapt such a radical shift, we can cut um, um, our working hours into half to spend more time on hobbies and cherish moments of families and friends. So let me pop on here again. Um, again, people are trying this, right? I mean, minimalism, it's why I coupled this reading with that documentary. It is something that's actually happening now. So I, I mentioned, I lamented that people weren't, you know, leaving their jobs to give examples of living um, better lives. Um, Thoreau did that, right? But again, he's a problem because it, it's not, he doesn't quite become the ideal we want him to be. Whereas you could, um, the guy in, you'll see in the film, Happy, Happy he's it's, it's pretty much an ideal thing that he did in a certain kind of way. But as this person rightly notes, you, you don't 
don't have to do that. And as I noted in my last deep dive on minimalism, um, you look at something like the Nordic model of, of um, employment, where people work just 30 hours a week, six hours a day. It's not the radical thing that Thoreau did. And Thoreau, again, he takes it to extremes. And he says that. He wants to sort of put it into a corner as much as he can of the Spartan lifestyle. But you could see, while well, that is extreme, 30 hours a week from 40 is not that extreme. But 30 hours a week from where we are right now in practice, where you have this sort of, you know, um, notion that with companies like Google and all and, and Tesla that people work incredible hours and Elon Musk famously you know notes that he keeps a, uh, a sleeping bag on the at the Tesla factory so he can you know look at what's going on in the production line where they're making Teslas and roll out a sleeping bag to sleep and then go back to work where 40 hours a week is just a dream because you know many of these companies are expected to work far more hours than that and the ideal that someone like Elon Musk is setting up is to work even more. There's the other extreme of Thoreau, six days a week, but then there's something like 30 hours a week, which um, as we saw with the plenitude economy, which is that other documentary, you know, one of the two alternative short documentaries for this week, that you can imagine an economy where, where people work less and it's a way of sort of de downsizing the economy of so-called economic degrowth. Um, let's look at the rest of this comment. Uh, yeah, some might uh, rebuke that the current materials aren't enough to grow human population. I read a book explaining the, um, the food and water shortage. The problem isn't having inadequate stuff, but the unequal distribution of those materials. I believe we should work on better redistribution of resources rather than producing more stuff. So what this person is saying is right. Uh, we have a big population on this planet uh, of human beings now. It will be 8 billion before long. By the middle of the century, 2050, it will be pushing 10 billion people. It may, it may stabilize in this century if we don't do anything to help stabilize it, but it may stabilize at around 12 billion or so. And you can say, well, that's just impossible to sustain that kind of population on this planet. And it's true, many people, and we're going to read Peter Kalmus, a scientist who looks into all this a little later in the term, and he thinks the number, we, sh we should reduce the population down. Probably should. But the point is, we can sustain it at um, even 10 or 12 billion, certainly at 8 billion now. It's not that there's not food there or, or water there, but there's enormous, you know, inequity in it. And we're going to see that. Um, actually, I think it's the documentary for next week will be Cowspiracy. And, you know, if you look at something like the production of beef, well, you know, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, as I, as I noted before, you know, you can produce 30 pounds of lentils or you can produce one pound of beef for the same amount of emissions. Beef is incredibly um, land intensive and all to grow all this food. And there's the other issue, it takes an enormous amount of water. And as I note, you know, you could um, take short showers, you know, all year long with a low flow shower head and people do this and they're, and, and, you know, they're trying to make an effort to, to conserve water, which is absolutely terrific. But you know, I forget the exact number, but that's about equivalent to a pound of beef. So much water goes into the production of beef and all. It's incredible. So if we were to reallocate those, those resources, um, if we ate largely plant-based diets, you know, and, and we cared about making sure that everyone on the planet got water, which we could do, um, we, we, could, we could sustain this population, which this person notes. But um, let's jump to the next comment. Yeah, someone talked about Thoreau in eighth grade, which is amazing. Um, this person thought it was uh, um, impressive that Thoreau arrived on his own. Uh, yeah, not so much. Um, surviving on his own involved um, his mom's home cooking and all. Uh, the fact is, 
that he would not have been able to do this if he wasn't a straight, wealthy, um, white male. Um, and this person said they hadn't considered class before, but it's quite true. Not anyone can move to the middle of the woods to sustain their life. Um, and he's ableist as well, you know, because how do you do this if you have a medical condition? Um, and just to be clear about that, I mean, why being, you know, a wealthy white man, um, Thoreau didn't have to worry about how he actually got his food and everything. You didn't read it, but if you go further along in Walden, he makes a big deal about um, that he had these this bean field where he grew beans there at Walden Pond. And that was his money-making idea, and he was going to make money from it. Well, if you actually read it and read the, the dollar and cents thing, it, it didn't really make much money, and it wouldn't quite work out. Um, he was, you know, he did have income beyond what he did there. So it's not like it was sustainable in an economic way or that he could afford his way of life. And the fact that he, you know, did go see his mom and all, I think that that made a difference, um, you know, to him because he actually was being fed and all there. So um, it's, it's only someone wealthy who could do it. I mentioned, you know, being straight or being white because, um, and being a man because it just would not have been safe for certain people to, to go out and do it, be out there by yourself like that. Um, if you're a woman, maybe, uh, if you were not, if you're, you know, an openly gay person, I just don't think that would have been particularly safe at the time. So, you know, this is all his privilege showing. There's a lot of privilege this guy has, and a lot of it is showing here. So um, I just think we, we, got, we can't forget that. I mean, it'd be, it'd be nice if it wasn't all there. It would be so much more interesting if another person had done this, and the stakes were different, and the person were different. It's not the reality of it. So that's you know, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know how to put this. I some have, sometimes feel the same frustration with some of our readings as I do with some of our documentaries that I, I wish they could be, could be different. I wish someone other than those two guys had made the minimalist film. But, you know, we have what we have. But it doesn't mean we can't find things of value here, I guess. That's the point. Um, uh, Thoreau's ideas are quite interesting in the sense of consumer culture and fashion trends. Um, if you knew what was going on in modern day in terms of fast fashion, I don't even know how you would act. Uh, yeah, um, so, I mean, that is the thing about Thoreau, right? He draws our attention to something like fashion in the sense of, you know, the fashion industry, clothing industry. Um, but it has changed so incredibly much then. Um, and the film that you are watching this week, The True Cost, is, you know, um, it, it just underscores where, where we are today. And it's, it's really extraordinary what this culture, consumer culture, has become. I mean, it, it's interesting if we had all paid attention to Thoreau 154 years, 170 years ago, um, things would be different, but it, it wasn't. And the consumer culture that he is, you know, wanting to draw attention to is problematic. Yeah, it is, it is, it is grown beyond, as this person notes, anything that he could have imagined, and it was unchecked, right? I mean, we had times in our in our country where, you know, um, free market capitalism was sort of reeled in during the original New Deal and all, but now it's not, and we, we see the horrific implications of this because free market capitalism is, is ruling, you know, globally, and consumer culture has, has taken over. Um, and aside from, you know, Thoreau's argument regarding happiness and all, which is obviously important, but the environmental implications are just, you know, devastating. Um, uh, yeah, so a number of people noted that they found Thoreau um, problematic, but this person, you know, uh, talked about how much uh, uh, they enjoyed the first chapter of Walden. Yep. <coughs> Um, and it was interesting because in the case of this person, I, you know, um, explained about Thoreau and as a consequence, this person said, I set my expectations low for the book. Um, well, he's still all of these things. I think that what he did for two years he spent at Walden Pond was extraordinary. And I think this is a, this is a wonderful reading of Walden and, 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 and acceptance of Thoreau to be able to see beyond that. Um, 
this person wasn't really phased after reading what he had to say. It would may have been easier um, task for him to do than someone else. The fact that he did it despite already having so much in life he left behind is what I found of importance. And, and that's a great way to, to approach this and just to, to get to that. You know, we can talk about Thoreau's privilege and it's there. It's the 800 pound gorilla in the room and he's got all kind of privilege working for him and all. But the fact that he, he, didn't, he doesn't acknowledge it in the way that we would want it being acknowledged, you know, in the 21st, but the fact that he was willing to just set it aside, right, to not, you know, in his 20s decide to, you know, make his father's factory, because his father owned a pencil factory in town, principally a pencil factory, decide, you know, st instead of working there and trying to make that a super big business and become super successful, he, he sets, he steps outside of his privilege. He doesn't entirely, right, and that's the thing I was just mentioning, you couldn't even lived out there if he didn't have certain privileges with respect to being, you know, wealthy and, 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 um, and a man and straight and all that. True enough, but the fact that he, he does it at all, the fact that he has a certain kind of solidarity with the people who live like that, there's something there. Again, I know, you, we could roll our eyes and say, yeah, but, yeah, but, and there's a lot of yeah, buts there with Thoreau. But there is something to him that he, that, he, that he did this. He doesn't quite acknowledge the privilege, but on the other hand, he steps away from a lot of it. And that's, that's something that's, you know, it's worth noting here. Yeah. Uh, first chapter discussed the absurdity found in spending the best part of one's life earning money in order to enjoy a questionable liberty during the least valuable part of it. Yeah, um, part stuck out to me because of while um, it's not related to climate change and it's not directly. Um, this way of life so in so many ways are used to, uh, this way of life so many uh, people are used to and plan ahead for, um, may uh, turn from a questionable liberty to virtually no liberty at all if the earth continues to warm in the way it has already been. Liberty will feel meaningless if we no longer reasonably live on the planet we were born into. Um, yeah, great point. Um, so, yes, um, you know, this, where we are going, is completely unsus unsustainable. And Thoreau talks about this liberty, but it does raise a question, is there still time to do it? And the answer is yes, there is. But we really need to, to pay attention to what Thoreau did in, in questioning um, life. And also, and I, I just want to keep underscoring that, you know, civil disobedience thing. We need to remember what Thoreau did, not just in his his actions in, in living at Walden Pond, but in his way of objecting to um, problems in the world. And slavery was one, and he worked out a formula for addressing it. Again, with Thoreau being Thoreau, it's hard to sympathize with the fact that he spent one night in jail and then he writes all about civil disobedience. Fair enough. And Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. both spend nights in jails, lots of them. You know, and Gandhi, of course, famously does you know, hunger strikes there and all. But still, Thoreau was concerned and, 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 and was laying out what to do. And in a way, you can see his project at Walden Pond as kind of related to that. It's not like buying with your dollar. It's not like voting with your dollar so people will say, and you'll hear that, you know, um, you can um, sort of protest corporate actions by not buying from corporations that do bad things or questionable things good. And you can, you know, you can try to find companies that are responsible and are concerned about the environment and social justice issues and all fine. But if you still spend the same amount of dollars and you still are promoting, you know, um, um, consumerism, even though the consumerism may be more responsible, you're still in the project. Thoreau has another project which is more radical, and, and, and that's why it can be combined with the civil disobedience thing, I think, is that, well, what if you just stop giving them your money, the corporations? What if you stop buying into the rhetoric, buying into the fact that, you know, every season you need to buy new clothes, which in Thoreau's day was, you know, 
two seasons a year, and now we have, as people noted, you know, one every week. But what if you stop doing that? What if you stop giving them your money? What if everyone did it? Um, in a way, that's that's an act of passive resistance. It's not like you're, you know, because people were, by the time, incidentally, at this time, very concerned about like factories and all, not for environmental reasons, but social justice reasons, the way people were being forced to live at the time. There was a major insurrection in Europe that happened um, right at the time, right, right around the time Thoreau's writing wall in, which is the Chartist, you know, revolutions of 1848, which swept across Europe. But in that case, you know, they're, they're actually, in some cases, violently, you know, attacking things. And ever since the Luddite rebellions of the early part of the 19th century, um, like around 18 to 12 or so, were, you know, um, so-called frame breakers. People were, um, or so-called Luddites as well, where people were actually attacking factories, destroying machines, you know, and intent on you know, doing that kind of very violent action. Thoreau's is different. Thoreau's is nonetheless striking a blow against factories and consumerism, but it's not by, you know, literally, you know, trying to burn them down or something. It's, it's passive resistance. It's saying, this project is a mess. I, I do not approve of this, and I am going to withdraw from it. I am not, you're not going to spend, you know, vote with my dollars to keep giving you uh, my money. I'm going to not make much money. I'm not going to spend much money. And I'm not going to, not going to be, you know, part of it. It's a very intriguing idea. And it's interesting to think that the same underlying thinking, in, in a broad sense, that gives birth to um, so the essay on civil disobedience and the idea that we can, through passive resistance, subvert something like the um, um, you know slavery um, project, which wasn't exactly what happened right with the Civil War, but the civil rights movement that will come, you know, nearly a century later with people like Martin Luther King, or over a century later with people like Martin Luther King Jr. did use that to great effect. So. It's interesting to think about, but let's uh, go on before I get too far behind. Um, yeah, Walden carries that. So let's not forget, though, that from an environmental point of view, Thoreau is going to be seen as a pioneer of, as this person rightly notes, um, conservationism and environmentalism. He, he was part of, you know, in the 1960s, people looking... Um, people are becoming more environmental and supporting things like the growth of the EPA and before that the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Solid Waste Disposal Act, and, you know, with things like um, the first Earth Day and all that was happening. People look to, like, Thoreau because Thoreau did an important thing in that if you read Walden, and you know, we can't forget this, even though it's it's not what we're focusing on, it is a celebration of nature in the sense of celebration of wilderness or near wilderness and why it's so important and why it's so invaluable and what we get from it. And that's important because why would you work to conserve or save um, something that you don't care about? Thoreau and folks before him, you know, the romantic poets in England, people like Wordsworth, they, they helped us appreciate nature and underscored its relevance and value. And as I noted in English 22, people like Rachel Carson leveraged that because they know that their readers care about nature because of the work that these people did 100 years before. And then Carson can say, well, we have to save nature. We cannot let wilderness and all be destroyed. But who would care if you didn't care about wilderness? Arguably, 400 years ago in uh, the West, people didn't care much about wilderness. They saw it as scary and a place where criminals lived and, um, you know, wild animals and all. And this wasn't very valuable to people. Thoreau made it valuable. So we just can't forget that. But anyhow, let's get to the rest of this comment. Um, this person notes that this is a facile idea. Um, it's a strong way to put it, but I, I see the point here. Of conserving and protecting the natural environment will save us from the inevitable devastation ahead of us. However, like, unlike the um, common response after reading Walden, the problem and solution has a lot, is a lot closer than we expect. The environment that we inhabit accounts for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions. Simply planting more trees or living near a pond for two years will do nothing. We must act locally. Despite 
despite Walden not being entirely relevant to there, there are a few important uh, takeaways. So what this person is noting here, and I, I just a little while ago spent a book talking about this, um, saving wilderness and all, it, it's great. And focusing on wilderness is great. And a generation of environmentalists did that, and a, a couple generations. So that whole thing we were just talking about, like the 60s and all, a lot of environmental activists were very concerned about saving wilderness, about saving forests. People, as you know, were you know, chaining themselves to trees and trying to preserve those areas. Fair enough. But what this person rightly notes, which is what I note in the introduction, you know, 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions are coming from cities. That's where people live. And, you know, we need to kind of shift our attention away from wilderness and all over to places that people inhabit, like cities and all. But this is where Thoreau, I think, still can be relevant in the 21st because his way of life, if you imagine it, and actually people are going to, uh, we have at least one or two comments if I, if I get to them, about people um, thinking about what would happen if Thoreau did this in a city. If you live a simpler way of life, everything that Thoreau did, but just didn't live in a little old cabin somewhere, but rather in a, you know, a smaller micro apartment in a city or in uh, um, it's like co-housing or something, how would that work? So that's something to think about because Thoreau can also be of use now. I mean, he was of use to that generation with their preoccupation with wilderness and places untouched by human beings. And if you've been through English 22, you know, we, we spent a whole term thinking about all that. But here, Thoreau can still be of use because he's thinking about how to reduce our, our footprints even in urban areas. So let's go to this uh, person. So this person had a, um, a good comment, the rest of the comment is interesting. Simplify, simplify. So yeah, that's Thoreau's. I mean, if you remember nothing from Thoreau, you only have to remember one word, just say it twice. Simplify, simplify. That is, I think, the big takeaway for us now. Um, and minimalism is, is the modern version of that. I mean, if you could say, what's minimalism about? It's simplify, simplify. Um, not everyone needs to go to the extreme length to become a full minimalist, and while it might actually be necessary because of how bad the current state of our world is, we know that this radical shift is impossible for everyone. That's why I have no expectation for people to become full minimalists, even uh, the people mentioned in some of the films for English 22, some which you'll be watching, uh, were an extreme minimalist. The important message that we need uh, people to, is, that we need that we, is that we need people to simplify, whether it is to an extreme or slight extent, in the point where our actions don't do harm um, anything or anyone. It's a really great point, and another <laughs> problem with Thoreau, in that, yeah, he's totally extreme, right? I mean, you know, live in a, in a, in a tiny, tiny little building. And a lot of people are just going to be put off by that. And, you know, um, as a consequence, they, they won't, if you reject it entirely and don't take the spirit of it, then I think that's, that is, is a problem with Thoreau. And a lot of people are just going to say, that's crazy. So what I mean by that is if you look at, say, houses in the 1940s in the United States, the average American house, under a thousand square feet, family of larger families than we have today lived there. Well, you know, that's not unrealistic, like Thoreau's Walden. I mean, people thought that was just fine back then and could see it just fine now. That would make such a huge difference if you, you know, I noticed this figure before, the average American home is something like 2,700 feet, and the, you know, American ideal thing is like McMansions are over 4,000 feet, and the ideals that are held up to us, things like, you know, the Cardassians who live in, I think, 15 or 16,000 square feet, you know, if we change our, our, our expectations, not to be, you know, where Thoreau is, but, but moving in that direction, back to what people were very happy with, you know, a few generations ago, that would be a more realistic goal for a lot of people at this point. But it is true that, that minimalism is, you know, impacting people in lots of ways. So with housing and all, you may know the tiny house movement 
some of which is a problem because, in fact, um, a magazine that I always enjoy looking at is Dwell, if you've read it and uh, looked at it. It's a very beautiful uh, um, thing to look at, to get the images they have. But if you look at the covers there, it's often um, small, um, you know, tiny houses or something like it. But they're almost always in complete wilderness kind of settings and it's held as an ideal. Um, instead, I think we need to be thinking about things like micro apartments and all in cities especially because cities are so incredibly expensive and this would be you know an opportunity to to buy something uh, relatively affordable in expensive areas although I, i've seen actual you know uh, in uk too youtube videos like micro apartments in the bay area which are still incredibly expensive um, but you could see where that you know, what Thoreau is doing is, in fact, being done by people today. But it doesn't have to go to, to that extreme. And that's why I thought this was such a, um, a useful comment. Yep. Um, so this person takes this up. Uh, through the lens of living in an urban area, instead of the wilderness, which I suggested in introduction, it's exciting to see how Thoreau's ideas can be applied. Tiny homes like the one introduced in the Dr. Minimalism come, minimalism come to mind as important in urban life. Um, I think they're a good upgrade to Thoreau's 100-foot cabin and are fitted with features to make them more adaptable for more people and cater to varying circumstances. Um, but if, you know, if eco-friendly spaces were made better available to low-income people, perhaps the minimalist movement could become more accessible and make greater strides. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting to think about this because voluntary simplicity, you know, Thoreau's words, simplify, simplify, doing it voluntarily, voluntary minimalism, um, is a way of kind of leveling things out, right? The great inequity, we, inequity that we have socially, where, you know, people lived in more modest dwellings, it would, you know, uh, try to, it would, it would reduce this gap between um, people of different, you know, economic uh, abilities. But, but let's not forget and keep I keep saying this, but I'll, um, it's worth noting. Yeah, we can say all this is something that we can do as individuals, we can do as individuals and all, but I mean, the great inequity that we have in the world today, in the United States today especially, is is based on an economic system that, you know, um, makes it very, very difficult for people to to live even an adequate um, way of life, you know, to, to an adequate to live in an adequate housing space, to have adequate food, you have people with, you know, food deserts where they're buying most of their food from dollar stores and all. This kind of incredible inequity has to be addressed, not just by us doing, uh, you know, a little minimalist experiment, but rather by significant, you know, societal, economic, cultural changes that has to take place as well. I think it's great to to do these things. I think it's absolutely right, but we, we can't forget that, you know, it's not enough. And and ultimately there's there's a takeaway from Thoreau there too, because you can say Thoreau is a problem. He just left the world behind, left the problems of the world. I suggest that in my introduction that, you know, even though the largest industrial um, town in, in the United States at the time was, a, was walking distance from Lowell, Massachusetts, he doesn't address that. He kind of runs away to Walden Pond for a couple of years. And you can see it's a cop-out. You can say it's a cop-out. He only lived there a couple of years. But he does come out. And the first thing he does when he when he leaves, you know, among the first things is he does that, you know, that lecture on civil disobedience. So I don't think that Thoreau was entirely a selfish person. There's a lot of him that is selfish, but, you know, to do that, to be thinking about that, to be having that, you know, on his mind and all, and then to come out uh, um, you know, to leave Walden Pond and then to become immediately engaged in, uh, in activism. And I, I see there's nothing but activism. I think that's, I think that's, there's something to be said about that and something we can't really, you know, forget about um, Thoreau. So let's go through a little more here. Yeah, uh, many people talked about their experience with uh, high school teachers. Um, Yep, and because of its impact on environmentalism, it's, it's something to think about, and again, not particularly our class, but how it did influence a generation of environmentalism. Um, 
It's, it is also interesting, I think it's such a great point here, that, that people have been thinking about minimalism since mass consumerism began. And, you know, most people, I think, think exactly this, what this person knows. I thought of minimalism as a modern practice, um, but it's not. I mean, people, in some ways, were in a better position to see it as it was happening. And what I mean by that is because a big change happened, you, you could see it. So someone like, like I'm in a position to, to see what online culture, the change that it brought, because, you know, it, it was not a thing. I mean, prior to 1990, I mean, yeah, the ARPANET had existed, the Internet had in theory existed, but prior to 1990, it had no, it didn't impact most people. So all this happened in my lifetime. So I can see that having happened. Many people at the time saw these things happen, and Thoreau was in a good vantage point to see it. Um, fast fashion, you know, fashion was an issue back then. Um, and Thoreau is bringing up something like vegetarianism as the future diet for human beings. And, and be, to, to note here, vegetarianism is not new. I mean, it was called, like in the Renaissance, the Pythagoras diet, um, or Pythagorean diet sometimes, because Pythagoras, this, um, you know, Greek ma mathematician, um, was thought to have been vegetarian. But in the, in the Renaissance in England, like 400 years ago, um, it became quite an issue because um, England was really encountering, and England and other countries had been encountering different parts of the world for quite a while, but they were encountering India. And in India, you know, um, there was this diet where people were eating, you know, largely plant-based diet, and it became known as the, um, the Hindu diet in England for, um, for a while um, because it, it revealed that there was this whole group of people who were, were not eating meat, and, and it was intriguing to people. Um, so it's come, you know, Percy Best Shelley, the writer, is, is another example. Um, and Thoreau is also of this movement, thinking about vegetarianism. Um, and Thoreau talking about it, you know, uh, the man who said there's no way to grow bones while eating, uh, only eating vegetables was funny. And you might remember that's the scene, that's the moment in Walden where Thoreau says, you know, this guy is saying it while he's walking behind an ox. And of course, ox are these incredibly strong animals, many times stronger than a human being. And, you know, their bodies, all that strength, those bones, those muscles are built entirely with vegetable material. It's obviously, you know, oxen, um, oxen or or um, vegetarian. Yeah, uh, first chapter, uh, Walden was extremely ahead of his time, but it's impossible to ignore how tone deaf it is. Yeah, so it's, it's a good point. It's ahead of its time, but it, by the time you get here, it does seem tone deaf in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that more modern pieces of writing give us better environmental advice and are more uh, clearly written. Well, yeah, fair, true enough. Um, Thoreau is interesting to think about for the reasons that this person noted to give perspective that these things are older and all. But, you know, if you're going to do just one thing, it's better to, to see more recent, uh, to hear more recent voices on it, which is why we watched the documentary on minimalism, had the alternatives on plenitude economy and things like that. So, yeah, let's jump to uh, the next comment. Ah, I, um, let me stop here. I want to note this because it really applies to this person's comment. In Thoreau's era, the average person in Massachusetts earned about a dollar a day. It's always a dicey business to try to equate, you know, what things cost back a certain time and what they are today. But that's about that. So let's look at this comment. Um, it so, uh, was a long read. When he talks about clothing, uh, he thought that it wasn't necessary to buy more clothes to follow current trash and trends because um, clothing can last quite a few years. For instance, a thick coat can be brought for five dollars, which will last as many years. Um, let's just stop on that, going back to what I just said here. Um, if you're making, an, if the average, you know, um, laborer is making a dollar a day, they would have to work all week to buy a good coat. One thing that fast fashion has done and mechanization has done even more generally, especially since Thoreau's time, is to um, make clothing and, and everything that we have cheap, really cheap. So, um, you know, I don't know, you know, what, what, 
what a laborer should be making today. I mean, obviously, we, we have a minimum wage, which is ridiculously low, which hopefully with this new administration will be addressed and, and raised. Um, but say at $15 an hour, you know, um, eight hours a day is $120. That's $600 in a week. Well, you know, $600 is probably the cost of what a, you know, a coat should cost maybe. Um, and, and one that could cost today, what I mean by that, responsibly um, materials, responsibly made with social justice, which again, we see the problem and the true cost with the problem with that. Um, but one thing we don't realize is that do we have these things at an incredibly low cost, which encourages us to have them in a way that isn't uh, sustainable. In other words, you know, when you can buy a coat for, for $50 or $60 rather than five or $600, you know, you're encouraged to buy 10 of them and not really care much about them rather than if you just had one. Um, but let's read through this here. Uh, Thoreau also made some good points about housing. It wasn't necessary to live in a large house. Thoreau himself lived in a small cabin, uh, much smaller than the average size of a house during Thoreau's time, or our time. Um, the average house during Thoreau's time costs more than his cabin. He states that an average house costs perhaps $800 in his cabin, according um, uh, to a table cost only $28. So, yeah, you can see the, the issue there. Um, it costs twenty eight dollars, but you know if you could uh, so that translates into you could you could work twenty eight days and have enough money to build that cabin. Of course, there are problems Thoreau didn't have to worry about the land. the land was um, owned by his friend and mentor Walt uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson to let him build his cabin there and all. but you can see what what Thoreau is trying to say here is that it just wouldn't cost it doesn't cost very much to to do this. And the tiny house movement, by the way, is about that. And it presents certain problems because, you know, people who, who do this usually don't own the land. Sometimes they're kind of peripatetic. They move around the houses are on wheels and all. But you can see why people do it because you could go ahead and build a house, not for $28, but for a few thousand dollars or and and it can and it can you know meet all your needs. I, mean, I don't know what it'll cost. Uh, I mean, actually, to build it, huh? That's an interesting thing. Uh, so uh, this little cabin here, which I built, uh, tried to as uh, sustainable materials, and so far as either um, things that are reclaimed, recycled, or um, plantation-grown redwood, um, this thing cost me. Uh, about $1,200, which may sound like a lot, but you know, people pay more than that for their office chairs and their offices, and given that this is an entire building, and, and it's hopefully one that'll last, it's, it's actually made to be repaired, so that um, it can, any of it can be taken apart and replaced, and the, my real goal was that uh, I would be able to dismantle the whole thing if I ever moved and, and take it with me, and even that it could be moved across town on a, um, uh, like if you had a, uh, um, a long bike trail or you could do it. The parts are that small. You know, to take a few trips where you could do it. But anyhow, um, you know, Thoreau's point is that n the things that we are expecting to cost a lot, you know, don't necessarily um, cost insofar as we can live without, you know, many luxuries. Um, uh, uh, so I happen to live in an area where housing isn't considered to be very affordable. Um, this person may be in California where very little housing is affordable. And there are luxury homes not far from where I live that feel that there weren't so many uh, luxury homes in my area and houses were smaller in size. Many people would be able to live in my area because houses would probably be more affordable since smaller houses tend to, to cost less. Um, it might end on that comment. It's such a good one. Um, yeah, so that is an issue. Um, the fact that um, there could be more affordable housing if there wasn't, you know, if we didn't do things the way they are. In fact, a few years ago, the, the governor of California passed a law to allow in-building in California in order to increase the number of habitable units. And what this is simply, and an example would be like the community where I live, there are, there are yards, and my yard would actually be one, I'm fortunate to have a relatively big yard, where you could build another structure on this particular lot. You could inbuild what's here and put in, say, 
maybe not as small as Thoreau, 150 feet, but maybe six, seven, eight hundred square feet, which would be more than enough for like, you know, um, a studio apartment or even a one bedroom apartment. Um, but it wouldn't be an apartment, it would be an actual house. And we could do that throughout California and these, you know, areas like the Bay Area, which is so expensive. Well, you know, you can, I don't know if you quite double the number of units, probably not that much, but you could increase them. But the other thing is when we get to the film Happy, you're going to see someone live in a co-housing facility, which is, um, um, I think it's Norway, but I, f I forget exactly. It might be Sweden. It might be Sweden. But anyhow, um, which is actually a very um, a viable option in other parts of the world, uh, like Norway and Sweden, and where it is here in the U.S., where you would take something like one of these big, you know, uh, uh, McMansions, trophy houses, and you would go ahead and, you know, um, uh, somewhat refit that so that, you know, five or six or ten families would live there and maybe inbuild in the yard as well. Um, and and that would be what possible, and it, it might ultimately be the uh, the fate of those buildings. It's, but it is, I mean, it's astonishing, you know, you're building buildings that are more than 4,000 square feet for, you know, a family, which is usually, you know, statistically in the U.S. for people or, or fewer. Um, it's just rather extraordinary. So, yeah, um, the takeaway from Thoreau, you know, uh, if you can see your way to bracketing off the problems which in, with him are formidable. He is sort of the great grandparent of modern minimalism, I think. It, you could find others, and of course it keeps going back, and, and other cultures, you know, it's very different. And in fact, I think it's fair to say most people <laughs> who, who've lived throughout history were probably minimalists in the sense that, you know, they didn't have closets full of clothes, they, they only had a few things like Thoreau suggesting they lived in relatively modest dwellings. People are doing that on the planet all over the planet now and not because not of voluntary things what i mean by that is you know in the the big mega cities on the planet places like you know mexico city and cairo and, and elsewhere um you know the cities are are, are are ringed by communities that are are not built within the housing codes or anything but the people have moved there in desperation, looking for jobs and all, and are living in, you know, makeshift buildings that are put together that are often very small, do not have running water, do not have, you know, sewage or anything of the sort. Um, that's a reality for a lot of people. And, and that puts in perspective what Thoreau's project is, and, and maybe this kind of can, can help with the bracketing off. Yeah, I mean, it's like minimalism, as I, you know, when I introduced it in the deep dive, I said, you know, this is not for everyone. Most people on the planet do not need to minimalize because of what they are living now, the way they are living without very much at all. And their climate footprint is very little as a consequence. But Thoreau, it's a certain kind of solidarity there. I mean, saying, you know, yes, I am actually a very privileged person. I, this is what he, you know, he could say. He, he has a great education. He has wealthy parents. He has, you know, everything is set for him. But he chooses not to do that. He chooses to step aside from that, to, to not do it. And there's a certain kind of solidarity with everybody else on the planet in doing it and saying, well, I'm not going to be a Cardassian. I'm not going to aspire to that. I'm going to I'm going to live like everyone else as much as I can. Yeah, I know he only does it two years. I know there are problems, but the, the core idea there, there's, there's something to that. And again, let's not get, you know, think that it's just all about personal um, choices and all, because that would be a great move to make, I think. Sure. Uh, no one's denying that that wouldn't be great, you know, social, for social reasons, environmental and all, but unless we restructure our, our country to, to, to fairly treat everyone else, those sort of symbolic actions of solidarity aren't going to have, you know, uh, aren't going to do it by themselves. We have to have a system that's better, that, that you know, um, takes the needs of other people into account. But that's not to say that minimalism isn't something great. And also, I think all these things, these personal actions are great because they, they keep it fresh in our mind. In other words, we, we're thinking about things that we don't normally think about. And I think that, it, in the end of the day, is the real takeaway from Thoreau. Um, as I noted to, at the very end of the introduction, to, to stop 
and think about your life, to become more mindful in, in, in like a Buddhist sense of, of your life and what's going on, to, to not just go through the motions that have been scripted for you, but to stop and think, you know, what, what am I doing here? What's my life going to be about? I mean, okay, I know everyone does this, I know I should do this, but is that what I want to do? Is that what's going to make me happy? I mean, these are the questions that Thoreau's asking. And at the end of the day, forget everything else and just think about that. And as I suggested in the introduction then, it's not so much about Thoreau and what Thoreau did. If we, if we, if we get bogged down in that, there's, you know, going to be a lot of problems there. But I don't think this book is about Thoreau, and at least that's the way I choose to read it now. And when I first read it in my teens, I thought differently because I read it like everyone else. But, but I think it's really about the reader, not this guy who wrote it. It's about us, and it's about, it's causing us to stop and think. You know, you're not going to do what he did and all, but, you know, exactly what he did. Of course not, but it, it's encouraging you to stop and think about your life. And it's giving you an example of a guy who did it. And if you don't like the way he did it and your problems the way he did it, fine, don't do it like that. Here's your opportunity to, to correct you know, Thoreau's flaws in your own actions. But I think that's what's important. And I think you know, in so many ways, we just don't think about life, even though we're engaged in living it. And Thoreau wants you to think about your life and what that will mean for you, for, for other people and, and for the planet. And I, and I think that's, that's, that's a pretty great thing. And I think, you know, we should, we should be grateful to Thoreau for that, you know, even, even with all his shortcomings. Okay, that's it for today. Um, and uh, I'll see, you'll see me <laughs> next week. And I hope you have a great week until then. So take care.